Okay, so let's have a look at the images you've brought along today. Tell us, what's this? I purposely decided to, to not really show images of my work. I, I do lots of talks about my work, but I've recently come back from Brazil. And it was, I went out there for a business meeting and then I took, I think, the first serious holiday I've had for about two years. And this is a triptych of uh, found chairs. I sort of don't know where the, the sort of life of the chairs and how they started, but these are sort of chairs found in and around Rio. And they're sort of used for uh, old boys watching the street, watching the world go by. And I just love this kind of idea that they've been uh, customized. And like if I go through the images, the one on the left, they've sort of lent it against uh, a pillar to sort of create a bigger, more comfortable backrest, or at least that's my take on it. And then the second one has sort of been bolted to a tree. I can only imagine it started life as a, you know, a bus shelter chair or something like that. And then the last one, it's very difficult to tell from the image, but it's got a, an elastic band on the table and it's holding down a, a, a bill from a restaurant or something like that. And it's just these sort of strange ways that furniture is um, misused and has, and has a second life. And it's not really about my work. I'm not a, a Martina Gamper or anything like that where I take components or anything. But I just find this, this, this kind of story and the, and the life cycle of a product really interesting. So, so when you're asked to design a light or, or a chair or something like that, wh how, what is your starting process? How do you, is, it, is it sketching? Is it um, Googling? What's, where do the ideas come from? Where do the forms come from, the material choices? It can start in lots of different ways. I'm sure the other designers that will talk today will, will say the same kind of thing, that inspiration can come from a variety of sources. But the way we frame our work is that it's materials driven and process led. So even though it, it could be seen as slightly cliched, we do go into the factories, into the workshops, and, and do a lot of desk-based research into production techniques. And this is obviously a, a pylon with lots of kind of cabling going into it. And um, if anyone's ever been to Tokyo, it's sort of a, I find it a very organized city. Um, but it's this kind of organized chaos. I mean, I can't work out what is doing what, what goes where, and anything like that. But, but somebody does, and it, in some, in somewhere in there, there is a system. I just find it very beautiful, this, this idea that it probably works very well, but it's this kind of organized chaos. And do you know why Japanese cities that are so organized and efficient, why they have all these cables slung up in the streets? Is, do you know? It's because of earthquakes. Because if the cables are underground, which the Japanese you know, would want to hide it all away, but if there's an earthquake, they would only find out where the cable had broken by digging it up. And of course, the water pipes were also in the ground, so it would be highly dangerous. I knew there was a logic in there somewhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a little bit of my, my studio, and what I, I just want to talk about prototyping briefly. Um, not particularly about the content. I mean, this is, this is a new lamp we're launching, but it's not a, not a particularly lovely shot of it. But I mean, I could talk about this for a long time, prototyping. But this is sort of where do you stop? When you work with a, a brand, whether it's a small brand or, or a huge brand or you know, someone, a startup or anything like that, it's sort of how much, how much do you do? And particularly when you're working on the kind of royalty model, where everything you're doing is at your own risk. It's sort of how much work do you do? How much, can, how much do you guarantee that a product's gonna make it through? How much cost do you take on? How much time do you take on? And this particular example is, is something where we went all the way through. So instead of handing it over to a third party and you know, essentially having a middleman in the process, we decided that we developed the whole thing, made everything work over the period of six months with a, somebody on a sewing machine and then bending up fiberglass rods is that why, why sort of give it to a brand at the end of that? And so this is one of our first attempts of maybe going direct. Okay, so this is a product you're going to self-produce, and, yep. and, and how are you going to retail it? You're going to sell it through shops? Are you going to set up an online store? So we've got a new, um, new website launching in a couple of weeks, but it's a sort of a dedicated inquiry sort of thing. But we're, we're going to sell it direct to architects, to retailers, to distributors, and you know the, our work is now sold really globally. It's got a really big network, network and it's just sort of, thinking about the idea of maybe tapping into that and sort of diversifying from the, the royalty model and the fee model to ma maybe now doing a bit of self-production. You're starting to go down the entrepreneurial route. Yeah, I mean, we, we're constantly looking at different sort of, um, sort of money streams and uh, cash flow options and all of the things to, 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 to be able to run and grow a studio. And I think it's just a logical move. I mean, we get so many, because the, the profile is quite good at the moment, we get lots of direct inquiries all the time, architects, interior designers, and, and so we now work with the brand partners that produce our work to also sell our work. 
So it just enab enables us to also take on more risk of doing more royalty projects. So your final image. OK, so this one is a bit of a plug. Um, and so this is, um, this is sort of like come to Design Junction. We were kindly given a space by Della Espada, a really big space. And um, in our installation, if anyone's been, it's, um, sort of, there's 2,050 cuts and folds. And um, I'm sure when my studio watches this back, they're just going to be they're going to be hating me because I, I well, was they were still doing it when I went in on yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, with, with me building. saying faster and quicker and, and more folds and uh, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, w w I think my w all I'm trying to do with this exhibition is sort of um, reconfirm how I approach my work. The traditional model in in consultancies, which, which is my background, is this kind of user analysis. So starting by talking to users, breaking it down, and you know finding finding the market need and things like that. But now we kind of do the reverse. We now sort of just do material and construction research. And it's a universal appeal. So, and brands love it because it's not about a, a styling choice and it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's something that is timeless. Um, so this exhibition is showcasing the, the process and production behind each project. And also, you know, we're, we're starting now to think about lighting and things like that in space rather than just, um, uh, you know, singular products. Brilliant. Actually, um, w it was the theme of the first day of talks, a very strong theme that one of the speakers said, you know, designers, you should start by redesigning your business model. You know, you, yeah. it, the, the business that you run is as much a, a product, a creative process as yeah. the, uh, the, 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 the lights and the tables. And, and it's the all about brand. Uh, a designer's name is, is incredibly powerful. Um, and um, the, the more we do this, and, and that's why I keep redesigning the website and, and everything like that's why I take these spaces, because brands... I, I sort of are, are in a way all powerful, but as soon as you remove the designers from this equation, they, 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 there's nothing left. So I think, des I, and I don't want this to sound too condescending or anything like that, but designers really need to focus on their own name. And it's sort of like do one thing really well, talk about one thing really well, you know, even ha have, a, have a message, have an ethos, and, and keep hammering it at home. It's a, it's a simple process, but it's been really beneficial for us. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I guess Tom Dixon is the ultimate example of that. Yeah. He's, a, he's a person, but it, his name has become a exactly. brand. And yeah. people are still really confused by it. So people will come by the stand and say, are, are you a manufacturer? Are you a designer? So they think that Benjamin Hubert is now a brand, and who's designed this light, and who's designed this chair? And it might be my fault. It might be a little confusing, but... I, but I think uh, the designer's name is, is much more than just designing a product now. It, is, it, it can just be, it can be, a, it can be a brand. It doesn't have to be a Tom Dixon model where you produce and sell everything. It can just be the, the, the design service model and it can still be at the same level as a, you know, as a, as a worldwide brand. Brilliant, Benjamin, thanks so much. Good luck with brand Benjamin Hubert. Yeah, thanks.